what hope and joy and purpose and freedom we have because Jesus Christ is alive. The message of the apostles, the confirmation of the gospel, the basis for all that God has promised for the future. We find in the fact that on the third day the tomb was empty and he appeared to his disciples. As Ted talked with us and then David read the scripture and Dan led us in song about our being family and coming together and planning to spend forever with each other, I thought of this passage that they came together with all their fears, their doubts, their struggles, their anxieties and concerns. Then when they saw Jesus, we find them filled with joy instead as they were in the presence of his hands and his side. And then Jesus said, I'm sending you out as the Father sent me. And how that parallels and reflects who we are as the Lord's people. We have our challenges, we have our setbacks, we have our obstacles. We come together as brothers and sisters. We lift our voices to God, we check that tomb, it's still empty, and we go through the appearances of the Savior and we're confirmed, we're convicted that He really is alive and coming one day. And then as the Father sent Him, He sends us out into the world with that life-changing message. These signs of life we've considered, some seven, actually lead to the sign of signs, Jesus' own rising from the tomb. Much has transpired since those first 12 chapters of John that we call Jesus' public ministry. Starting in 13, it's the night before he's put to death and he's with the disciples and he washes their feet. And in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come again and take you to be with, my, with me. Chapter 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I in you and you'll bear much fruit. Love one another as I have loved you. And that will show the world that you belong to me. And when you're brought before the authorities, when you are faced and confronted with those that resist your faith. Remember they treated me, Jesus said, the same way. And then chapter 16, talking about the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor, another helper, Jesus said, that the Father will send in my name. And then in 17, that beautiful prayer for himself, for his immediate circle of followers, and then for all of us who would believe through their message. And then the sign of signs. Bracketed by the fact that in chapter 2, when Jesus was asked, what sign do you show us? He said, destroy this temple, speaking of his own body, and in three days I will raise it up again. They didn't understand. They couldn't put it together. He had just cleansed the temple. And they asked him, who put you in charge? Who said you could do that to our system? And Jesus mentioned not the water to wine, which had just taken place, the first sign, nor did he talk about those that would follow, but the sign of signs. This temple, you'll destroy it. And in three days, I will raise it up. And John explains that he was talking about his own body and his disciples did not understand until he was raised from the dead. These are the bookends, we might say, of the book of John. Here is the sign. And then after John records it, he says many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In Matthew 12, if you turn over there, beginning at verse 38, again the question is about Jesus in control of the situation. Show us a sign. And Jesus said, no sign will be given this generation except that of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, and so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. 
Several times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus would take the disciples aside. In fact, beginning in Mark 8, after Simon said, you're the Christ, the Son of God, and he would explain to them, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed and arrested, handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock me, spit upon me, crucify me, and then three days later, I will rise. You can read it in Mark 8, in Mark 9, and in Mark 10. And every time we see the disciples perplexed, puzzled, confused, what does all of this mean? But on that first day of the week, when the stone had been rolled away and the grave was empty, and then he appeared, the pieces came together and they knew what they were to be about because of what he had come to accomplish. And it's the same for you and me. So let's go to the Gospel of John. We'll start in chapter 19 and consider some major themes that lead up to that great moment where he presented himself to the disciples and then including doubting Thomas called Didymus or the twin. Beginning of verse 16 of John 19, we might call this a contradiction because here you have the Savior of the world, rejected, condemned, cast aside, mistreated, and abused. Pilate handing him over to be crucified. He's bearing his own cross. We know from Mark 15 that Simon of Cyrene also carried the cross because he was compelled to. Some suggest that Jesus fell. We're never told that, perhaps side by side or together. Simon of Cyrene carried the cross because he was forced or coerced to. He was pulled in, coming in from the country. Jesus took it because of his love and compassion. What a conflict between the fact that he's giving his life for those who want nothing to do with him, those that have disgraced him, those that have shouted with the mob, give us Barabbas instead. Hebrew Golgotha is another word for the skull. We're never told it was actually a hill, though it's been described that way. The two men, Jesus in between, some have said one died in sin, one died to sin because he repented according to Luke's account, and one died for sin in payment for you and for me. And that sign, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews, in three languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, but the chief priest objected. Don't write that. Just put that he said that's who he was. Pilate, what I have written, I have written. Is he trying to salve his conscience? Is he trying to make one last statement? He's the king killed by his subjects. He's the liberator nailed to a piece of wood. He is the one who brings hope and victory and liberty and here he appears to have none of that John is intent by inspiration to make two things abundantly clear one is that Jesus truly died and the other is that he genuinely appeared since he died and since he appeared there is no other conclusion except that he was raised from the dead. And those that have discounted or disputed or tried to argue against the resurrection of Jesus must deny one of these two. Some would say, oh, he never really died. He just swooned. He passed out and they came and took him to a tomb and revived him with spices. And the third day he came out as if he could have gotten past all that agony. That excruciating from which we get the word crucifixion, pain that he suffered. Or others will say, oh, he really died, but the appearances, that was a hallucination. That was something that they imagined. It was a figment in their minds. Here we see the spear going into the side of Jesus. Two separated liquids coming forth, blood and water not pumping as if the heart were still active, but rather flowing. And John writes as an eyewitness because he wants us to know 
for certain that when the soldier came, verse 34, and this was the result, look at 35. He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, so that you also may believe. I was there, an eyewitness. And what I saw is indelibly impressed on my mind. And I want all the world to hear and to know and to be aware. I watched him die. I saw that spear, and this is an image of a Roman spear from the first century era. When that blood and water flowed, I knew and the centurion, the Roman officer, knew how many deaths had he participated in. And it was obvious. There was no question this man had already died. And for that reason, he didn't break his legs as he did the others. Breaking the legs reportedly would prohibit the victim from being able to push up again on the cross and try to gasp for air. Therefore, he would asphyxiate more quickly. The purpose of the cross was to make death as slow and agonizing and awful as it possibly could be and to make a spectacle for the passers-by to gawk and gape and gossip at the person that was hanging there. The scripture had said, not a bone of his will be broken. And you see that in verse 36. And it fulfilled that prophecy and they shall look on him whom they pierced. And what John sees lines up with what had been said centuries earlier. And it's being played out before his very eyes. It's confirmation that Jesus had breathed his last. Then we find, starting verse 38, Joseph of Arimathea a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one. Is that an oxymoron? Is that a contradiction? Is there such a thing to be a closet disciple? To be in hiding? To cover up one's true allegiance? Is that possible? Some have suggested that he's done that for so long that now he can't hold back anymore and this one for whom he could have spoken up has died. And so Joseph, previously motivated by fear of the Jews, has a new courage. And he goes to Pilate, may I take away the body of Jesus? And he granted him permission. And Nicodemus, we read about him in chapter 3, you must be born again of water and the Spirit. And in chapter 7, when he said, we can't condemn a man without first hearing the testimony against him and letting him speak. This Nicodemus, who'd come at night, Maybe another reflection on his timidity. They came together bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. And we're told that's way too much to anoint one body. That they overdid it, perhaps as a sign of grief or remorse or repentance. This is a picture of myrrh. It was one of the plants, one of the spices used for a body after it had been buried. There's a consecration there. There's a recognition, this one that died. And remember, he's not yet overcome death. What a statement of faith this is for Joseph of Arimathea, who offered his own new tomb in which no one had ever been placed, and Nicodemus, and his partnership between the two of them. It's early on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene is there. It's still dark. Who would roll away the stone? It's already moved. She ran. She came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Did she expect a resurrection? Did she announce he's alive again? No. And this is the remarkable honesty and transparency of the Word of God. They've taken my Lord away. The body's missing. Someone has snatched it 
and transported it somewhere else and we don't know so she's upset because she too had come to pay homage and honor Peter and the other disciple apparently John go to the tomb and the other disciple he tells us he ran faster than Peter what a note that is couldn't wait to get there what could have happened how was that stone moved away is there anyone there what evidence can we see that the body was in fact taken and that other disciple stooped and looked in saw the linen wrappings lying there but did not go in and then Simon Peter came trailing him and entered the tomb and saw the linen wrappings and the face cloth not lying with the linen wrappings rolled up in a place by itself so the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered he saw and believed and yet verse 9 says as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead so the disciples went away to their homes and we're going to see that they're gathered with the doors shut for fear of the Jews and how surprised they will be when Jesus appears and shows them his hands and his side and then how excited they would be to let Thomas know who refuses until he can witness it for himself and then this mission they would all have so faith is forming it's growing and developing it's not yet where it's going to be the tomb is empty the stone has been rolled away the body is not there what does it all mean and so he believed and yet they did not understand many times you and I might wish we could have been among those early disciples of Jesus oh to have seen the signs to have heard his voice to have touched him to have eaten with him to have been together in his presence and yet might we have been as reluctant and resistant as they were though he told them over and over and over again and still it doesn't quite make sense to them Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping when she stooped apparently the opening was low and one had to bend over to look inside she saw two angels one at the head and one at the feet woman why are you weeping and she answered them because they've taken away my Lord I, I do not know where they've laid him and then she turned around and saw Jesus but perhaps because of the time of day or because of her tears or because of her lack of expectation that he might be alive she didn't know it was Jesus she supposed him to be the gardener sir if you've carried him away tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away Mary Rabboni my master my teacher one word Mary oh don't you know she wanted to throw her arms around him and never 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 let go when Jesus says in the King James Bible touch me not he's not saying that his body somehow is immaterial and can't be touched it certainly was he would show them his hands and his side Luke tells us he would eat broiled fish in their sight and they would in fact touch him it can be rendered stop clinging to me Mary there's more to be accomplished I can't stay here you go to my brethren there's that family again we're each other's brethren we're Jesus's brethren he could have said my disciples he could have said my subjects he could have said my followers my brethren and tell them I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God Mary Magdalene's confusion is now conviction I have seen the Lord her conviction though is not yet theirs 
And though sometimes we point to Thomas and the fact that he had to see and touch for himself, weren't the others somewhat like that too? Because Mary has told them, but let's lock the doors. Let's circle the wagons. Let's be sure that we're safe and secure and the Jews can't get to us. And they're afraid. And that's verse 19. It's evening on that first day of the week. Jesus comes and stands among them. Peace be with you. Shalom Blaka. The Hebrew greeting. May it be well with you. That's when their fear turned to joy, which led to the commission. As the Father sent me, I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And this matter of forgiving sins doesn't give them the power in and of themselves to grant pardon, but rather as those who would preach the gospel as we do today, to say that sins may be forgiven by the blood, confirmed by the resurrection. Thomas, called Didymus, which means the twin, that was simply a way of distinguishing him from other Thomases such as the fact that Judas Iscariot was not the only Judas. Thomas was not the only Thomas. They're saying to him, we've seen the Lord. You, you realize that Mary's come to them, I've seen the Lord. They're afraid. Then they see the Lord. What happens? We've seen the Lord. What's Thomas do? <laughs> I'm not convinced. And then when Thomas is convinced, he's going to become part of that army that will go out and tell the world we've seen the Lord he's alive oh what consolation what peace of mind it's impressive that Jesus honored Thomas's request in verse 27 reach here with your finger see my hands reach here your hand put it into my side he didn't rebuke Thomas, though he might have. He didn't shun him or push him away. He didn't say, you should have believed. Without firsthand experience, he said here, the doubting of Thomas, preceded by the doubting of the other disciples, preceded by the confusion of Mary, and then all of them turning to absolute, unswerving, no turning back, Conviction that Jesus is alive again fills us with courage and zeal and energy to share that news as well. And then Jesus tells Thomas, do you believe because you've seen? Blessed are those who did not see and yet they believed. Not only are you and I in that company of those who did not witness the resurrection of Jesus firsthand, but all that have gone from that time to this have decided to follow Jesus because of reliable witnesses who staked and risked and gave their lives for this one central fact that changed everything, that was the basis of all they were and all that they became and all that they did. And when Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God, there was a recognition Noted previously in John and in the other Gospels that there was no mere man. Yes, he was man, but he was God who'd become man. And hearing those words from Thomas helps us to draw the same conclusion. That he who went to the cross for my sins, he who overcame the devil and death, and the punishment I deserved, he is my Lord and my God. 
And I will not stay, and you will not stay, shut up in a room, afraid of something, or afraid of somebody, and keeping within ourselves what we truly and wholeheartedly believe is true. These signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. No wonder when the gospel was preached, those that were told of his resurrection and accepted that fact were baptized that same day into his death and going in that water as if into the tomb with him and then affirming because he's alive, I'm alive. And as the Father sent him, he's sending me, and he's sending you to spread that message to all. If you today would respond to the Lord's invitation as they did, everything is ready. Won't you come? Let's stand.